All right, welcome to episode 59 of the At Bed Podcast presented by War Media, where we give you our thoughts on the latest Chicago baseball news as well as take a trip around the league. I am Saul Rodriguez along with my co-host Miles Porter as well as joined by our war colleagues and Chris Pennant and Gabriel Wilkins. Uh, Miles, how are we doing today, man? Hey, you know, doing doing good. Uh, I learned yesterday that I made the All-Star team, so I'm very happy Let's about go. that. Let's hey. hey. go. Let's go. Let's go. Thank you. Man. Thank you. It's been, it's, been, it's been a good grind this season. The boys are the boys are balling. And we won a big game yesterday against uh, the Tropics, which is another, one of the, like, the second best team in one of the leagues that we play in. Very competitive game. Lots of lots of back and forth between the umpires and the teams. And uh, so, no, it was, it's great. And so, uh, the All Star Game is at the Milwaukee Milkman Stadium, and uh, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited uh, to be there. Hell you know, yeah! I got, a, I got a migraine today, by the way, so I'm a little <laughs> bit under. I'm a little bit <laughs> under the weather, but aside from that, I feel great. <laughs> hey, well, we appreciate you coming out, regardless of that. So, hopefully, you feel better sometime soon. Uh, I hey, yeah. I will say also, the Cubs are in looking for a third baseman. There you go, Miles Porter. You know, they you, you know, know? Check, check out his <laughs> LinkedIn. Cubs, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> apply, you know, whatever. But no, anyway. <laughs> anyway that's awesome, man. You know, right? Congrats, though, Miles. Uh, Chris, how we doing, man? Trash, bro. Nah. <laughs> Absolute trash. The only thing saving the only you see, I got off screen. We're gonna this is the only time we're gonna put it on screen where you got the saving grace of Victoria <laughs> right here. That's about it. That's about it. Oh, uh, how about you, Gabe? How we doing, man? Man, life is life. Yeah. You know, done dealt with a lot of tough things. This month just had to recently get myself prepared to lay my uncle to rest. But through it all, man, we still going through it. You know, we 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 no matter the weather, man, we're gonna put it together and do great things no matter what. So yeah. he lived his life to the fullest. I'm gonna live mine to the fullest and talk about the game I love with y'all, man. Hell yeah, hell yeah. And then may rest in peace, of course, Gabe. And so th- th- we'll we'll make this episode out to to Uncle Wilkins over here. So you know, let's go. My uncle John doing... Burns, yeah, they, man. They're John Burns. Years of living, man. That's a blessing. That's awesome, man. All right. So uh we got a big episode, of course. The trade deadlines coming up. We're recording this on Thursday, July twenty seventh. Uh, so we'll talk all things Cubs, White Sox, as well as some of the deals that have gone on. The White Sox stuff will leak into. Major League Baseball as well, because, of course, that, you know, that trade implicates a lot of things um, going on. The Giolito going over to the Angels, but a big episode, of course. Uh, so we'll get right into it. Of course, the the Cubs, uh, you know, they took uh, both games against the White Sox in that Crosstown series. Uh, they're 50 and 51, eight and four since the All-Star break uh, with the Red Hot Bellinger, a Red Hot, you know, offense in general. Um, and you know, the White Sox are sitting at 41 and 62, three and eight since the all star break. And before we get into the White Sox, that's going to be the bulk of what we talk about today with that trade that went on. Uh, Miles, what, 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 what do you take up? What do you think about the Cubs, you know, recent hot streak and, and the fact that they're looking like they're going to be buyers at this point? Yeah, you know, it's, it's great. This is a team that you're starting to see them click on all cylinders, and, and, and for the most part, really not much change with this roster aside from having a few guys uh, come up and a few pickups here and there, and, and Master Boney and Talkman. And the, the contributions that, that uh, they've given uh, to this ball club was just uh, incredible. And even with Stroman, who's kind of been getting hit hard lately, this team is still finding ways to win games. So I love it. I really, I really do. It's cool seeing this group come together. I, I've i been saying it for some time now that the Cubs are about two, three key pieces away from being com- even more competitive. We're a competitive team right now. We're still just missing a little bit of a something. Um, what that something is, I couldn't tell you specifically. I, I love what we've been doing offensively. Cody Bellinger has been out of his absolute right mind, and that has been so fun to watch. Um, so, no, it, it's great. It's great to, to see, like, good competitive baseball right now on the north side. We haven't had that in a few years. Um, so, you know, uh, I'm, I'm excited where this ball club is going. Yeah, and, and, and you're right. They are missing a few pieces, and hopefully they can add at least a couple uh, of, of those, you know, you know, before the deadline. Uh, as I yeah. mentioned, the third baseman, as I mentioned, you know, as we mentioned before on the show, the bullpen needs some work. Um, but, yeah. you know, there's, there's a lot to go around, a lot of help. And, of course, they're trying to make a postseason spot, I think, trying to make a – trying to make some noise. Obviously, I think next year is a real year where you really try to gun for, you know, the NL Central to, you know, be, you know, be competitive the whole season, right? Not just uh, the second half or whatever. Uh, but, yeah, no, they're playing really well right now. Uh, like I said before, you know, 
that there's, you know, Tyone's looking a lot better since the All-Star breaks at three starts, 186 ERA uh, with a .98 whip. So he's looking better. Um, but, for, guys, from the other side, uh, like I said, you know, we'll get to the White Sox, you know, because that's, you know, with the Giolito trade. Uh, but, Chris, well, from the other side, you saw the Cubs these last two games as they uh, took on the White Sox. What do you make of their play um, as well as if you believe they're buyers or sellers at this point? It's tough for me to say. I know Gene McIntosh, a uh, friend of the friend of the show, br- a brilliant Cubs fan. He said, I saw him on Facebook, said the Cubs should not be sellers. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to argue that when you go come out of the all-star break and you win, was it eight of your eight of your first 13? Mm-hmm. Eight of 12. In a week yeah. di- eight of 12, mm-hmm. that 75%. That's yeah. in a in a weak division, not just in a weak division. They the Cubs have felt like a pretty quality team. Even you look at their last maybe 20 games or so since they I'm looking at baseball reference right now. Since they lost to the Giants on June 11th by 10, Mm -hmm. they haven't really had that many blowouts and they've Mm -hmm. been winning a lot of games by double digit run scores. That's a team that's starting to put it together. I was talking to another Cubs fan, Sean Campbell. Shout out to Chirp Radio 1071. And I, we were in agreement that the stuff we talked about in the preseason, the Flyers, um, especially Bellinger, have worked out. Hosmer didn't do that much, but Bellinger has proven his worth, and those guys are on one-year contracts. And they've developed, continued to develop pitching and position players. So you add on, even if it's not for this season, you make, you can make kind of cautious moves to put you in position to really compete, hit the ground running next year. Cubs are in a good spot. No, yeah, definitely. And, and you mentioned some of the guys that have worked out. Uh, one guy that hasn't, but is, hasn't really put a dent in anything really is Mancini. Also, he hasn't worked out, but um, it's still a good, a good guy to have in the, in, in the dugout, a good guy to have in the clubhouse um, from what we hear all the time. I think that's one of the reasons why he stayed. Cause I think any team could easy, easily be like, let's keep Master Boney up here and let's DFA this guy or something, right? Who knows? They could easily do that, but they haven't, I think for a reason. Um, Gabe, from the other side, uh, looking in, what have you thought about the Cubs uh, recent play? Hell of a job, you know, none, none else to really say, just, just, but a hell of a job, you know, guys are performing and rising to the occasion at a pivotal time in the season in which Jay Hoyer a couple weeks ago wasn't willing to publicly exp- express whether or not the Cubs were buyers or sellers. And you talk about the play of Cody Bellinger, whose left-handed bat has been providing a ton of power as of late, but how about Christopher Morrell? coming up with some big hits the last couple of nights in the Crosstown series, driving home a couple RBIs in a two-out situation in a spot that proved to be the defining moment in the ball game the other night in game two of that Crosstown series. And then you talk about the play of Master Boney, Tauschman, and, and other guys, even in spite of the pitching and finding ways to win. And, and the one thing about this group, even though, as you guys alluded to, the, the signing of Mancini did not work out, this is a guy who's played – with a World Series team, mm-hmm. being in the fire last year with the Houston Astros. Cody Bellinger, he's no stranger to the playoffs. Marcus Stroman is no stranger to the playoffs during his runs with the Toronto Blue Jays in the middle part of the last decade. So they got an infusion of vets with some young guys that's play, that have playoff experience, and they're willing to play and fight under a guy, David Ross, who, in spite of drawing a lot of criticism in this city, has these guys clicking at the right time. It'll be interesting to see how far they can go and what moves they make at the trade deadline, but are they sellers? Absolutely not. Even though it is a seller's market that could prove to be beneficial should you want to go in that route. I don't think the Cubs can afford to do that in the NL Central that, as you have alluded to, and we've all alluded to over the last couple of months, is still available for the taking. Yeah, and, and it's it's funny because uh, that's the one that's the good thing, right, is the fact that, you know, it's still good for the Cubs. They're not going to sell and all that. But I think it's funny because the everyone, every other team or every fan base was so excited to see Stroman and Bellinger out on the market getting dealt or something like that. So uh, as much as I like a, a, a crazy deadline, um, the fact that that means, you know, that they're going to at least try to, you know, get out there and compete is obviously a positive. But uh, to kind of break down, uh, kind of transitioning to the White Sox, before we talk full on Giolito trade and all that stuff, uh, we can talk a little bit about the series because obviously that's the biggest part since the last time we recorded the biggest series between these two guys, these two teams, of course. Um, in game one, Hendricks and Kopech, 
Uh, the Cubs were ended up winning that one seven to three. Uh, Kopech went five innings, giving up four. Uh, Hendricks went six, uh, giving up uh, three runs. Um, and of course, Alcaraz with the uh, save there. Um, Cubs bullpen did their job in that game. Swanson hit a couple bombs, uh, and as well as Horner and Morell in that one too. Uh, what were you guys' takeaways from that game in particular? We'll start with you, Gabe. Uh, in particular, with the Kopech start, with where where it went wrong in Game One for the White Sox. Well, where it went wrong was he left a couple pitches up. Mm-hmm. Some some pitches he made weren't bad pitches. Dansby Swanson just did damage. And that's what put them on the board in a major way after a mishap with T8 fielding the ball with a with a bad throw to Andrew Vaughn that he couldn't pick, you know, down. And they got up early. And then Morrell left another pitch up, and he went yard. And they lost control of the game. Before you know it, it was a 5-0 lead. And White Sox, you know, they they fought back. But the player of the game to me in game one was really Seiya Suzuki robbing Yon Moncada mm-hmm. of a grand slam. Because I feel like if that goes over the fence, the game gets a little bit interesting. Oh, yeah. Even though they still would have been down a, a couple of runs, it gets a little bit more interesting down the stretch. But, mm-hmm. I mean, when, you're, when your pitching staff can't give you six innings, each and every night of the guys in your pitching staff can't do it the way that Michael Kopech was unable to do it. And then on top of that, you know, he, he gave up five runs, didn't walk too many guys. I had the numbers in front of him. He only walked one batter, which is saying a hell of a lot considering his last few starts. But he just got hit hard. And to mm-hmm. me, the Cubs just took game one. You know, Swanson, it was his first time in the cross-down classic. He seemed like he was pumped up a bit. And Chris Morrell, like I say, man, he's a guy that when he get – a hold of a pitch that he liked and he do damage with it, it's going to have a tracking deposit number on him. And he, he, he did that on Tuesday night. Yeah, yeah. no, that me. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Chris. You go. Uh, I, I can't agree more um, with a team like the White Sox who have been slightly less anemic this year with the bases loaded, but still unable to find a grand slam at any given time that would have been somewhat of a fire starter. Like they were probably on the brink of being sellers anyway, but to see a grand slam at home in the Crosstown series would have been a fire starter for a fan base that was already pissed and a team that was looking for something, anything at that point. And for it to not only be, you know, not only be an out, but to be an out in the way that it was, you saw it on Makata's face afterwards. I saw the highlight on that so many times on SportsCenter. It was number one on SportsCenter. And, you know, fa- folks were shocked. They were just like, you know, this happened at that time. And Kopech, for him to just walk one batter is, like Gabe said, it's pretty good. He struck out five, but mm-hmm. he's just still been unable to go more than into this, to get further than the sixth inning consistently. His last five starts, he hasn't gone further than, two thirds of the way through the sixth. And this is a guy who you were, you were expecting to be one of your top of the rotation guys. And it's just endemic of the season at writ large. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And uh, kind of, you know, to what Gabe said as well uh, with the Suzuki catch. I mean, yeah, that, that, that was for sure would have changed the game. I think completely, especially with how crazy, you know, game two was Um, I think it just shows how much this game could have gone back and forth. So yeah, that that was pretty crazy. But Miles, in your opinion, you know, with, with the way the the Cubs were able to win that game, uh, what were some of the things that stood out to you in, in that in that win? I'm timely hitting. Um, and really, and really, nothing that I can say that has been said by Christopher Gabe. Jumping on top of pitches that you got to jump on top of. Um, you know, it, it's cool. It's cool seeing Danzy really embrace uh, the cross town classic the way he did in, in, in Game One, and so. You know, it's it's it. I think I'm a little bit more accustomed, especially as of recently, to the Sox pretty much kicking our asses, whether the <laughs> whether we're at the cell or if we're at Wrigley. I've kind of become accustomed mm-hmm. to that the past few years, but um, I, 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 you know, it's it's still it's still like a cool a cool series where there I think there there should be a lot of respect for both sides. And I've never been one of those Cubs fans to kind of dog the White Sox in a sense. I think you know it's. I, obviously, during that game, you see a lot of the issues with the White Sox showing, showing, uh, being on display uh, during during Game One uh, and also during Game Two. 
Um, so as much as I love seeing the Cubs take care of business, you still got to feel for your, your your brothers on the South side as well. Um, so no, I'm, I'm very proud of the Cubs. I'm very happy with, with how, you know, the momentum that they were playing with. Um, and then, I know we haven't talked really touched on game two, but that comeback was incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's just a lot, lot of good takeaways from that. Uh, Morel and Swanson, that, that's a they were a fun tandem that game. So I, I always and I always enjoy seeing both of those guys say And I think Nico Horner also had an amazing game, and then Suzuki would take away a grand slam. That's crazy. That's crazy. I wish I was at that game just to hear the reaction of both sides Sox fans groaning and Cubs fans just going crazy. <laughs> This is, this is what I love about it's what I love about baseball. So you it's, it's <laughs> Chris, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know I, I was gonna say that uh that him say, I mean saving a grand slam is almost as good as hitting it. I mean that's just is awesome. So uh but no you Miles, you're right though. I don't remember the last time the Cubs got the head to crosstown cup. I honestly don't. Right? I, I don't know. I feel like ever since that, that trophy came out, the 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 Sox has had it for like Nine out of the ten years, or however long. I don't. I don't they know if either. Yeah, the Cubs won the series. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, which See, is so... crazy. <laughs> and then yeah, the funny part is the Cubs won the Crosstown series the year the Sox won the World Series because I remember it like it was yesterday because they came in to thirty fifth and took two out of three, and I believe Corey Patterson had a big hit at the time, and I was so ticked off that Sunday, even though the Sox were in first place. I'm like, damn. I said, we we really lost to them. <laughs> lost to Corey. We lost to Corey Patterson. Right. I and know. By right. the way, enough of this two game. Like I, I don't. Oh I'm my tired god. Of this yeah, I know. Two yeah. here, two there. What do we do? Stop. Yeah, I don't like that either. And I don't I like that either. And make it every to weekend that. too. Like mm -hmm. these series should not be Dude, played on weekdays. To. Yeah. You they should not be played on weekdays. This is, I remember when they made that switch. I was still down the state. I was still down state in Peoria, but AM mm -hmm. radio has such a long wavelength that we got the score. And I was listening to it on the way into work, and they had um, an executive from Major League Baseball on, and it was Mully and Hanley at that point. And they were roasting her, like, not roasting, but kind of subtly, like, yo, what's the deal with this? Why are we going to this change with interleague play? Why aren't you putting, why, what's with this two games here, two games there every year? And you could tell she did not want to be on this call. One, because she didn't think that was, it was such, it was that big of a deal. Two because she sounded unprepared as as you could, as it could get, and I think they left her on the phone while they took listener calls. So she had not not only had to deal with actual informed sports radio hosts, but like Charles and Villa Park, who was so upset about this. And I was <laughs> laughing in my in my car because I felt the same way. But they they snuck the okie doke on old girl, and it was so bogus. But it was, they were right. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah. Ever since that happened, is ridiculous. And you know, uh, to make it even to make matters worse, twenty twenty four, it's the same exact thing, two and two. Um, and then I actually looked it up while you were talking, Chris, because I was actually, I actually had always wanted to look it up, didn't look it up. Apparently, this is part of it. This is a CBS article from like twenty twelve, which when they it said that uh, they were going to start changing it to four games most of the season, most of the seasons. It says as part of the changes, Major League Baseball wanted to minimize the competitive imbalance that currently exists with the schedule. For instance, the White Sox playing the Cubs six times this season is a break compared to the Cleveland uh, Guardians having the uh, having to face the Cincinnati Reds six times. In the new schedule, interleague play will rotate between the divisions, meaning teams in the in, in the same division will play the same interleague opponents every season. I, I feel like that's such a like lazy like reason. It's very what? lazy. Yeah. And let me say this. Oh. And let me say this. Did you see the twenty twenty four schedule? Yeah, it's now, doing it's two, a yeah. weekend series. Oh, it's a weekend between yeah. the Cubs and the Sox. On, mm -hmm. They're going to have a two-game set Friday and Saturday. They're going to be off both teams on the third Sunday of August. What? I've never – I can't recall a time in my life <laughs> where I have gone without a Sunday without White Sox baseball because the team was off. Maybe because I didn't watch the game mm -hmm. or I couldn't watch the game. But, yeah. like, that is so weird to me. Yeah. That you have We're a two-game so series man. playing on the <laughs> weekend. Really? On a Friday and Saturday night on the South Side, and then yeah. I can't get a game on Sunday. Like, and, and then and then this doesn't just affect White Sox Cubs. Mm -hmm. This affects other series such as yeah. Yankees Mets, mm -hmm. Giants Dodgers. This have been great games, you know. Yeah. Uh, Giants A's. All, like it. it this, is what, this is what brings fans in, in states yeah. and in regions together. 
Mm -hmm. You know, and, 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 and I, I don't like it. You even take the I-10 rivalry in Missouri between the Royals and the Cardinals. That's mm -hmm. the big deal. You know, it, it, it's it's crazy to me. I just don't get it, especially mm -hmm. when you're trying to incorporate interleague more into the current schedule where we're playing every team in the mm -hmm. National League now and up in the American League, so forth. Like, and you're playing your division opponents less. I, I just don't get that. That's something yeah, that needs to change. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, right, if you're trying to encourage more interleague play, wouldn't you want more, like, the three-game series, you know, for each side, in know. each stadium? It didn't make yeah. any sense. Don't you, want, uh, don't you want money? Don't you want yeah, money? Yeah. yeah. Especially right? on a Sunday. Yeah. A weekend day. Like, people off of work. Most folks yeah. is, at least, you know. Like, mm -hmm. August. In August. In August. <laughs> a Sunday. They're going to have a day off on August. Sunday in August. Rob. <laughs> And this Ooh. man just got a con. This man just got a new contract. Yeah, he did. Oh my, which means yeah. everybody is giving him a mandate to do this. Yeah, yeah, it's it's wild. Miles, I knew you were about to punch the camera right now. Uh, <laughs> the floor is your. The floor so is yours. Of Rob, man. I'm so sick <laughs> of him, man. <laughs> yeah, the oh fact that yeah, I mean, break that's... your equipment. Don't let my <laughs> don't let Rob Manfred take your equipment from you. But the modern day game of baseball. Welcome to. <laughs> I it. get signed by the Cubs. Yep. I'm paying. The... He's paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> you're like you're gonna be in office for longer. You, you're gonna get more money. Might as well uh, pay for your 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 iPad or whatever. But yeah, I saw yeah. Yeah, Manfred got extended to 29. Uh, we all, I mean, nothing needs to be said with Manfred. We all, we I think we all know how we feel about. Rob Manfred. Um, uh, but <laughs> yeah, big pumps down. You know what I'm saying? Only thing, yeah. only great thing Bop, I have cool. to say about Rob Manfred, only great thing is that he added a third wild card spot. Yeah. And, and bought the that wild card it. round. That but like that outside of that, there are a lot of changes that this game is undergoing that is just weird to me. I'm at a game yeah. with my father before the All Star break, and I'm having to explain to him the new extra innings rule. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and he's like to me, he said, man, that's not baseball to me. Mm -hmm. You know, and I still got an issue with the ghost run. If you're going to give mm -hmm. me a ghost runner, put him on first base. Make me earn the run. Yeah. Don't help me. Uh -huh. Don't help me. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 Bro, and, and then the momentum okay, is good. going in the, regardless of how people look at it, if that, if the visiting team drives in that run, no matter, even if the runner's on second, the next inning, they still have the momentum. Yeah. Yep. They're still up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now I'm chasing them. <laughs> yeah, I, I, like, I don't. I don't the, like that rule either. The way the relievers are built now, the way that everybody uses relievers, if they score one run to go ahead, you are you are mandated to be facing some dude that throws 120 miles an hour mm -hmm. with a 95 mile an hour slider. Like, mm -hmm. no matter what, Miles is completely right. That gives the visiting team the advantage every single time. And so you're going to talk to, you're going to put these words out that are just words. They're meaningless words. They're just literally blah, 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 blah. Why would you say anything about competitive imbalance and make all of these moves that imbalance the competition? Yeah. Especially when you got a pitch clock, by the way. Yeah. There's really no need for the ghost runner. You, you want to speed mm -hmm. the game up. You got the pitch clock in there. I mean, we, we could do away with the ghost runner if you ask me at this point. Yeah. Also, Gabe, you said, you know, the one thing that we would credit Manfred with and congratulate him with is the extra wild card. But I think like my niece could have done that, too, to be honest. <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> for sure. You know what I mean? I like, think, like I think that was long overdue to begin with. You're right. Yeah, like, I'll give him credit. I will. But I'm just saying that I don't <laughs> think I think a lot of people would add that because we have always talked about there needed to be more playoff teams. It would have been like, you know, or oh, yeah. like the wild or whatever. So yeah, but but you are right. It is the one thing that he yeah we will give him credit for. But ultimately, um, to kind of move on to more important things here, uh, we'll talk about the White Sox. Of course, the White Sox we talked about before. Uh, the three and eight since the All Star break, they made their first move and they traded uh Lucas Giolito and uh, Reynaldo Lopez to the Los Angeles Angels for two of their top three prospects. Basically, their top two because Logan O'Happy was number one to start the season, but he's a big leaguer. Uh, it's a catcher, Edgar, Edgar uh, Quieros, who's age 20. He's a switch hitter, uh, 964 OPS in 70 games this season. Um, and then you got pitcher Kai Bush, who's 23, with the 367 ERA last year. He struggled a little bit this year in 26 innings of work, but still looks pretty good on the mound. I saw some video on him. But, of course, 
this is this we'll t- we'll talk about more about the Angels after you know a little later, but this is a big move for the Angels because they're actually looking like they're going for it here for the first time. I don't yeah. since I don't know when since maybe the the, the Joe Saunders days maybe. Um, but for you <laughs> for you guys, and we'll, we'll we'll start with you, Gabe. For you, what is your take on this trade overall? As soon as you heard it. Well, for one, you know, it marked the end of an era. You know, I can remember being 23 years old, December 2016, and getting the news that Adam Eaton had been traded for Lucas Giolito and Ronaldo Lopez, who were both members of the Washington Nationals organization at the time. And these were the guys that were supposed to be centerpieces that helping the White Sox turn it around. For a while, it looked that way. The way that it ended, you know, it's unfortunate that you have to part with these guys under this circumstance, under these circumstances, because the team didn't live up to their potential for so many reasons. And I know reasons that we get into later on, but that that's that's really the, the, the takeaway from it is that this marks the end of an era. Everything that fans wanted to refer to this as is whether it was the rebuild or the retool or the championship window is closed. But nevertheless, for the White Sox to trade two guys that are on the final years of their contracts and be able to address needs and getting a catcher of the future, something that I don't think this ball club has really had a steady presence as far as it goes at that position since the days of A.J. Pierzynski, even though James McCann tried to provide it for a couple of years. It's a positive. You know, you would take a top 100 prospect for those two players with this situation, but they basically traded today for tomorrow. And I don't think White Sox fans would be able to evaluate how this trade looks until about three to five years from now when these guys eventually make their way up to the major league level. And Kai Bush, the left-handed pitcher that they got is more so closer to the major league level than Carroll is, who's only 20 years old and was pushed up through from um, low A to, to double A rather like quickly and is playing two years above where he really should be playing at this point in his career. So it remains to be seen. What about you, Chris? What are your thoughts on it? Oh, just the trade? Yeah, and the trade and the trade alone. But if you want to, uh, regardless on the, on the state of the White Sox, go ahead. I I just the the trade I go for the I'll go for the trade but just because all my thoughts are like it'll take a long time <laughs> but the the trade itself honestly is like like Gabe said the end of an era and it was an era marked by failure just abject cowardice and failure when this rebuild was promised it felt like the the necessary step in the right direction no longer trying to to make do with uh with a two by four when everybody else was using aluminum you know no longer just trying to get by it felt like the organization had decided to say we are going to commit to building a foundation building resources and then when the time is right making a move to be competitive which is which is what uh, since I've matured as a person, what, which is what I've wanted for this team, since I have matured as a person, I wanted to be competitive. I wanted something resembling, resembling, because you can't get to where they were, but resembling the Braves of the 1990s, mm-hmm. always being in the thick of the playoff hunt. And this trade, trading one of their guys who was not a franchise guy necessarily, but necessarily, but a flagship guy, one of the first people they brought in when they traded away an everyday headline player. Actually, the same two, same two guys were brought in in that Adam Eaton deal, went out in this deal. It just marked the, it it doesn't feel like the beginning of the end. It just feels like the epilogue. Like we've been sitting, it's like, this is like 300 where the, the, they found the hole in the gates and the Persians have been wiping the Spartans out for hours. And this is my man just sitting there on his knees and the arrows are coming down. And this is the end of it. This is about to be already over. All the arrows are all the people that we're going to see go out the door in the next few weeks. 
it's necessary. That's the one thing I can say. It is necessary because there's no relegation as there should be. And next year, the White Sox will open up play in the top division of ba professional baseball in this country. So they have to figure out some way to hopefully at least put a, 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 a sheen on the pretense of being competitive and at least give the impression that they're trying to build for the future. So in that case, it was necessary, but it feels like failure. It smells like failure. It looks like failure. It walks and talks like failure. So I'm pretty sure it's failure. Oh, it is. Because, I mean, let's be real. 2016, I remember talking with a guy that did the scores, keeping it the White Sox games as well as the Bulls games, my man Bob Rosenberg. He was like, man, what the hell are they doing? And I said, <laughs> I know exactly what they're doing. I said, they're trying to build a winner similar to the way in which not only the Braves in the 90s did it, the way that the Astros did it, the way that the Cubs did it, the way that the Royals did it within the last decade. And that's tanking for a few years to develop or get acquire high draft picks, right? Might I add, and not only acquire high draft picks, but hit with those high draft picks mm -hmm. and build up a system that consists of several top 100 guys and pray to God that at least three out of 10 of those guys pan out and be superstars while the other several are quality everyday players in the lineup. We saw that happen. But the problem was is that these guys deserve to have a manager who had been through it and done it and won at the highest level in the modern era to lead them and teach them not only the fundamentals of the game, but how to win. The high point of this rebuild was in 2020 after losing a hard-fought three-game series against the Oakland A's and – Jose Abreu winning American League MVP. We knew that Rick Renteria's days were numbered based on how he managed game three of that wild card series. Rick Hahn did a meeting with the press through Zoom on Columbus Day, I believe. And he said, we're going to get a manager that has World Series experience and has been the, the postseason on an annual basis, basically. They did that, but they happened to get a manager who – the last time he had managed, Tim Anderson was a freshman in college. Lucas Giolito yeah. was a senior in high school. I was Too a freshman experience. in college. <laughs> and I remember this because it was 2011. Same year I graduated man. out of high school. And I was 18 years old. And even though I have a lot of respect for Tony LaRusso and, and what he's accomplished in the game of baseball, he was not the same Tony La Russa that I had grew up with during the early days in the 2000s with the St. Louis Cardinals. He was not even this Tony La Russa that my father had grew up with back in the day in the 80s with the Oakland A's. They needed a manager that didn't just coddle them, but walked with them and put them in the line of fire. And when they didn't perform up to par, even if he didn't call them out publicly, at least had the balls enough to do it privately. They never got that guy. With Rick Renteria, he was their teacher. I think they had a close bond with him. And I appreciate Rick Renteria for doing the job that he did, knowing what was going to come. But they didn't finish it. They also never got the nine-figure player. To bring Manny Machado into the building on 35th and Shields and not give him the money to come here when he had ties and connections here. That's a problem. To hear Bryce Harper talk about how he had his eyes set on Chicago, saw as a little kid the 2005 White Sox squad and how loud the, the, the ballpark was at the time. That's tough. Those were the two guys that you missed out on and that you needed. I know for a fact, just knowing people in the organization, who have been there for over 30 plus years, twice as long as my mom was when I was a baby being raised in the ballpark, who told me on record, Rick Hahn wanted nine figure players, but there's an owner that has to sign off on the check. And there are so many times where we as sports fans want to blame players for things and understandably so who don't perform up to par, but you got to take a look at your front office and your ownership to know where the hell you going. 
and that's why sometimes when I look at this situation and I assess it, I can't be angry. I can't be mad because they never finished the rebuild. And how can I be upset at them when they never finished it? That's like me being upset at somebody building a home that I thought was going to be gorgeous, but they never finished the framework. If they didn't finish the framework, it was, it's never going to get built. It is what it is. They got to figure out how they can move on. But Rick Hahn is one of the most blessed men I know because I don't know too many people who have job security like he does. And to be able to do this for a seven time or it's just crazy to me. Because in any organization that has people with competence in it, he would have been gone a long time ago. And a guy who I know very well, who actually has come into my house many a days before he ever took a GM job, he would have been gone too, even though he led the, the Sox to the 2005 World Series. And that was Kenny Williams. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, like, I, I, I couldn't even imagine being a White Sox fan and enduring this type of stuff just because it's just so, like, so unfair to not only the fan base, but even to some of the players that are loyal to being here for a long time or whatever. Like, I just, it, it even though the on the North side, it's not all peaches and rainbows all the time. Like, it still is, it still just baffles me to this day how just blatantly and consider a guy like Jerry Ryan's or Fizz to a fan base. Um, it's just crazy. And then this could also be talked about on the basketball side, even though the bulls have spent a little more, but that's uh, as for a you know different, different day, but miles and your, what, what's your take, man, on the current state of the white Sox as well as the trade that they made uh, yesterday for uh, um, a couple of uh, pro top prospects from the Los Angeles angels. Yeah. You know, I, it's, <laughs> I was always like a Lucas Giglio fan in Chicago. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. uh, and it was really cool. It was just kind of seeing Ronaldo Lopez struggle as a starter in the beginning of his career with the White Sox. And then being a dominant bullpen arm, um, aside from some struggles this year. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, I think you know, going through something similar in, in 2021, I, I, hope, I hope the White Sox um, – I don't know. I, I'm honestly bummed out for, for that team and the fan base because uh, going into the season, despite the struggles of last year, we still had some pretty strong expectations for this ball club, especially mm -hmm. in a very winnable division like the Aero Central. So if there's one thing I'm hoping for the White Sox, that there are a few more moves that, that, that will come during this time. Um, I hope whatever prospects that they gain out of this um, I hope they treat them right because I know because, you know, the White Sox aren't known for having the best farm system and taking care of the players, the younger guys, um, as much as other teams do. So I am hoping for the White Sox that we're, you know, if we're, we're kind of going to jump ship here, we got to we got to do it the right way. And I, and I hope they kind of learn from certain mistakes they made in the past. The Tony La Russa thing, I, I, in this very room, I heard my dad debate debate one of his friends about, La Russa being the guy or not, and kind of like what Gabe said, I remember I remember Tony La Russa being the guy in 2011, 2012. That's what I remember when he was the guy. And so I I I don't want to, and, and I'm still kind of in the limbo about this, kind of trying to figure it out. I I I don't want to say that the White Sox wasted that window with La Russa. That's how I was feeling for a period of time. I know that it's like 100% on the players to perform as well. I'm just hoping going forward, um, we just make better decisions in terms of how we're going to operate this team and guys who are leading this team. You know, it's it's, it's clearly a ball club where not everyone is, is buying in. And, and I think that's very apparent. And clearly the morale of, this, of all these players are, are you know, it, it, every day kind of feels like a gut punch, even as we're talking about we're losing four to one at home against the Guardians, the division. So I think, I think right now it is – I don't know if it's so much of a talent thing. I think it's more of a mentality thing as, as to how these players want to do what they want to do moving forward, what the organization wants to do moving forward. We'll see. We'll see. Sox fans deserve better. Um, yeah, I just, I just want to see these boys win. You know what it is? It's a lack of leadership in the clubhouse. Yeah. It's 27 guys in a locker room. 
throughout these last few years, I would say the White Sox top leaders were guys that took the ball every fifth day. Guys mm -hmm. like Lance Lynn, guys like Liam Hendricks, who got the ball if the White Sox had the lead in the top or bottom of the ninth, depending on where they were playing. But those guys ain't playing every day. White Sox never had no veteran that held them accountable or pulled a guy like Tim Anderson to the side and say, hey, look, young fella, I see you struggling a little bit with shortstop. You want to take your game to the next level? Let's get to the ballpark early. And let's take ground balls or whatever. Let's work. They didn't have a coach that was like that. Yeah. And that's the type of leadership that this ball club and this team needed. And that's why I think a guy like Manny Machado could have been so healthy. Because I know just watching some of Manny Machado's offseason workouts in Miami and whatnot, that he would have took a dude like Tim Anderson under his wing as he was making his way into all-star status. There's no telling what he could have became or whatever. But some players got to have that mentality before they even come up here. And some of the guys that the White Sox acquired didn't have that mentality. They had to learn it. Luis Robert Jr. is one of those guys. I think he's just not learning how damn great he can be as a baseball player. And he's coming to the ballpark every day like, you know what? I can't waste this opportunity because I got so much God-given talent and God-given ability to do this thing at the highest level. Some guys have never – every we, we tell these guys how great they are when they prospect, and, and it's true in some cases. But we also got to tell these guys how important it is to work. And we got to be real with some of these fans too. I love White Sox fans, but it is a damn privilege to watch championship teams. And we have been blessed to watch a lot of – championship teams in Chicago and Jerry Reinsdorf needs to understand that it's not only just a privilege for fans to watch it's a privilege to have one and be able to put your money where your mouth is he said he wanted to win one seven years ago he wanted to win another one. he ain't acting like it and I'm at the point now where it's like don't tell me what you want to do show me and I see so I'm gonna take a wait and see approach with this team moving forward Paul, I, I I got my thoughts together. If you got if you got the time for me to stretch a little bit, the Chicago White Sox most successful period in their entire history came before the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. Social Security was not around. Social Security wasn't necessary when the White Sox were a major player in the American League. The White Sox are a footnote in baseball's history. They exist. They have existed. Much in the way that there are people you see in your school who you know their face, you know their name, but when somebody asks you, it's like, hey, did you hear about such and such? You can't quite remember what they look like. That is what the White Sox are in the annals of baseball. They went to the World Series three times in the first 20 years of their existence. They have been there twice since then. Twice. Yep. The Florida Miami Marlins have gone to the World Series the exact same number of times since they were incorporated in 1993. Yep. 30 years versus, versus 83. And there are some things that you can excuse in terms of times were different in terms of what went on. There was no such thing as free agency. There was a reserve clause. People pretty much did what they wanted with their money. Men worked two and three jobs and played baseball as a job. And then they worked at hardware stores as another job. There were two world wars, this, that, and the other, um, all of that. But when you have it, and Gabe, I know that, I know from, from, you're, from what you said in your, in your upbringing, your upbringing, you've seen this more close in person than I have. So I know that you must. I know that you're pissed because what you said about Jerry Reinsdorf is right on the money. This man had a world championship team in his grasp in 1994 and decided a work stoppage was more important. This okay. man had, yeah. This this man yeah. had a a World Series contender in his grasp and decided he needed a cigar smoking buddy. This man intentionally cratered what could have been a great team 
they were on the cusp of being a great team. And I, and I know that that's, some of that is dreaming. Some of that is, but I was at that ballpark all of those years from 2016 to 2022. And there was a sense in the air that things were changing. It was. When, when they took the Astros to the limit in 2019, um, there was a shootout they had at the ballpark. And I think James McCann might've gone deep twice like there was real love for this team. There was real love for this players. And that like Hawk Carrollson is a homer, but that Ricky's boys don't quit was real. That was mm -hmm. legitimate. And just like you said, he taught these young men how to be men in this game. And they loved him for that. The next step was getting a guy, people that you've mentioned in the pregame, in the pre-show, AJ Hinch or Alex Cora, guys who had been there and could take that matriculation to the next level. Instead, he hired somebody on his age level so that he could talk in the and share war stories with in the owner's box. There's no excuse for that. I'm tired. We there's no there's no opportunities for us to be the Yankees anymore. That opportunity went out the window in 1938. There's not even an opportunity for us in the same span of time that I mentioned. And I've done book reports on this. I've written papers on this because I took this White Sox fandom to heart because I thought it was a birthright because of the sole fact that I was born south of Madison Street. As much as I have lambasted the Cubs for fun, for real, for pride, they went to the World Series so many times through the 30s and the 20s that it, it even, even late in their history when they went, had postseason opportunities, they went, they went, they just came up short, there was something. And so that lovable loser tag stuck because people who were not aged remembered the times where they came close and just fell short. White Sox fans endured seasons of exactly that sound. We have endured that. We are overlooked, overwrought, and over overdone in the most picturesque sense of the word. A patty left on the grill and forgotten. We are burned at the bottom of the pile. And I am I, I am so close to finish with it, with this, that it just put it all into perspective. There is no, there is no logical reason to continue supporting this team the way that they're going. It does not make reasonable sense. It does not make any rational sense because the same things that happened yesterday are likely to be the same things that happen tomorrow. I forgave not getting Manny Machado and Bryce Harper because I thought we could go forth with what we had and other guys would be on the market. And at some point, Jerry Reinsdorf would turn into Mike Illich and say, it's our time now. I thought that too. I know in I know what you're talking about. Instead, he, 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 he is still, I'll finish with this. He, if you read the Jordan rules, there's a passage where he is walking home with his mom from his school and, and there was an awards presentation and he was, I think, 10 or 11 in, in middle school and he didn't win anything. And his mom is walking with him and they're, they're in silence. And she said, you couldn't even have even won one. And you would think that that would put the iron into somebody's spine, but instead he is still that same middle schooler walking home in Brooklyn who is a face in the crowd and nothing more. And he has become, and the White Sox have become by extension, that nameless gray face in the crowd. And there's no reason to support that. None. And you know what? I, I can't, I can't tell fans not to be frustrated. I can't tell fans as much as I would like to how to fan. Um, it's it's hard for me to talk about a guy like Jerry Reinsdorf because I've sat in the owner's box with this dude. I have things, personal things from this guy. It was things that he did that helped my mother in my mom's career, working in Major League Baseball and so forth. But one thing I do know about Jerry, and one thing my mother has always made clear to me about Jerry is when it comes time to spend the money, he don't want to do it. And for what reason that is, I don't understand it. I don't know. It's hard for me as a fan to say I'm not going to go to the ballpark because it's just like the child in me comes out when I'm at that ballpark. The memories that I have attached of being a White Sox fan come back to me at that ballpark. I remember being a kid 
my mom telling me before I even decided to be a White Sox fan about the 93 AL West Division Championship team and how she had me in the midst of that and how it was a it was an experience to be able to witness people she got to know up close in person, such as a Bo Jackson and a Lance Johnson doing their thing and on October stage, you know, and about the 94 White Sox and how it all got ruined by a lockout that, as you alluded to, Chris, Jerry Reinsdorf had a major hand in, in spite of the fact that his team was in a great position to win the World Series and Frank Thomas was on his way to his second straight at AL MVP. You get it back 11 years later, but you never build off of it. And this team has had so many great players come through here over the last, I would say, 10 to 15 years that we have had great moments with, but we don't really have any postseason moments with. I was going to games during the Chris Sale era. I used to go to games every day that man pitched. Every day. And I've seen some incredible things, but it baffles me how he's one of the greatest pitchers in the history of this franchise, but he never played in a playoff game in White Sox pinstripes. Same could be said about Jose Abreu until later in his career. And it really hurts me that we didn't win for him. You know, and, and so with Lucas Giolito, and, and, you know, we talked about Tim Anderson, who could be on the block. That was the guy that brought me back. Because there's a guy that is a, is a black man from the South Side, having memories of seeing Frank Thomas, Ray Durham, not having too many African-American players for a stretch, to see him at the ballpark, seeing him come up the music that I listen to. And I listened to on the train going through my day-to-day -day grind and hustle. It was like, hey, that's my guy. Wearing the number seven. Same number that represent my bird month and everything like that. We only two weeks apart in age. I done met T.A. I had engagements with T.A. Carlos Rodon, a guy that I used to see around. Like, you know, we, we, we didn't capitalize, man. And it's unfortunate. It's very unfortunate. And, 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 and it's a fan base that's desperate as hell for a winner. And I would love to see another World Series run. But when that may come, I don't know. I would have loved it even if we had just won the Central three years in a row or four years in a row. That would have been something to, to, to tell stories about because we've never had a stretch where we were that dominant. And the only reason why I'm using the word we in this situation is because I'm a diehard White Sox fan. And I don't really, I'm going to be real, I don't root for too many Chicago sports teams. The Bears, I follow them only because I'm a Justin Fields fan. The Bulls, yeah, I followed them when I was a kid, but I realized as I got older, I was more of a Michael Jordan fan than a Bulls fan. Blackhawks, yeah, yeah, I liked them. And I thought that what they did in the 2010s, the White Sox had a great shot at doing in this decade. And I thought this was going to be the best damn decade in the history of Chicago baseball. Where that is now, I guess we'll never know. I, I, I don't know. But I, I'm, I know one thing. I will continue to keep watching the team, but it's only because of the joy that it brings me. But it's hard, especially at these last couple of days, because I've never seen this team drop games to the Northsiders the way that they did. And, and, and there's so many losses that have been tough. Like when fans say this is the toughest loss all year, man, look, I'm not going to even trouble you with some of the losses that I've been to this season. I've seen multiple games where this team has had two outs and been an out away from closing the game, only to lose it. And, it. and it leaves you at the ballpark for like 30 minutes to an hour, like, what the hell just happened? Did I really just see that? And am I seeing this again and again and again in this era? That was supposed to be the golden era? I just know the one thing I learned through all of this is don't get drunk off of the beginning stages of a new era. Watch it carefully and witness it as it unfolds and then seek to assess when it comes to this team. Yeah, I mean, uh, you really can't say it much better than you guys did right there. I mean, that says it all. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, this team has a long way to go, but I will say this. 
some of the positives here is the fact that they're protecting a guy like Cease and a guy that's protecting a guy like Luis Robert, who were rumored to, you know, be the heavy, garnering interest from plenty of teams, um, including the Astros, for example, that supposedly were interested in both. I saw rumors or just rumors. I don't think the, obviously the Sox <laughs> would even consider that. No. But on a lighter no, note, though, I, 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 yeah, on a lighter note, though, which I thought was hilarious, was that I did see a conversation happen on, on Twitter of these or X, whatever you want to call it nowadays. Uh, uh, that of that, you know, that Cease and Robert thing that supposedly like, uh, Andrew or sorry, Astros fans were like arguing about whether they wanted to give up Chaz in a deal for like Cease and Robert. And I was like, I Ch- Chaz McCormick, yeah, <laughs> I saw that. And I, I, I was at, at that, I just, I was like, it's enough internet for me today. But that, that's what you can do when you're a winner. That's what you can do. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Man, you can fair, pretty much argue over like little that. things like team yeah. chemistry <laughs> and like, well, why would we need this guy yeah. when we bought? We got Chaz McCormick. You see what yeah. he did last week? That's what you can do when you're used to winning. Yeah. yeah, that's fair point. Fair point. And it's like one of those things where it's like, it's just, yeah, I mean, White Sox would be, I think, I, I mean, I know that you guys have said a lot of things about the White Sox that are true. But even then, I think it would still be ridiculous for a team like the White Sox to even consider uh, getting rid of a guy like Luis Robert, who's obviously a superstar of the you know the game right now. So, uh, go ahead, Gabe. And I want to say this: How in the hell can this team afford to trade Dylan Cease when you already traded Giolito? Lance Lynn is on the block, and you might trade. Uh, another one of your starting pitches, like you, you gonna go into next season with having to get. You gonna have to acquire at least forty percent of a new starting rotation, if not sixty percent. And then, you, and one of the guys in your rotation, you don't even know if he's gonna be a full time starter. You can still ask that question, like, is Michael Kopech really a full time starter in this league, or is he better off in the bullpen? At, at this point, like, I, make it make sense to me. Because you asking a you asking a front office and an ownership group that don't like to spend money to go out here and try and get five new pitchers, they not doing that. Be realistic. And then you gonna ask them to trade him to the Astros, who have one of the worst farm systems in all of baseball, even though the White Sox farm system isn't the best. Like it's deplete. Like come on, make it make sense to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I agree with you, Gabe, on there. I mean, it's just one of those things where people just talking and talking. I mean, plenty of people, pl- plenty of people were talking about the Cubs like they they, they had watched them the last couple of weeks and saying they're going to sell, they're going to sell, they're going to sell, trading Marcus Stroman tenfold. Uh, and they hadn't watched. Uh, you could tell they hadn't watched. Uh, you know, a game of the Cubs in the past like month or so. So I get what you're talking about. It's just, it's just. It's just one of those things that I had to bring up because it was as baffling as I think I've seen in a while. Sure. Um, but to kind of uh, move on to Major League Baseball and what this kind of means for the Angels now is they're getting Lucas Giolito. Um, to kind of reiterate what you know uh, what Miles said is uh, Lucas was for sure one of my favorite White Sox players. I think I, I, I think is you know he was goofy. He like you know he would always be on the, the Rose rotation, uh, the John Boy podcast, and I thought I always enjoyed his uh, his his conversations there and. So, you know, for his sake, I hope, you know, just not only just because of Otani, because obviously we kind of want to see Otani make the playoffs here. But what do you guys see with the Angels now is they're actually – looks like they're going for it now. So, Miles, I want to start with you. What do you think about this deal from their side now? Uh, do you think it's enough? Do you think they need more? If so, how would you do it? I mean, you know, it's good seeing them go for it. It really mm-hmm. is good seeing them go for it. Yeah. Um, they have their work cut out with them in the Rangers and the Astros. Um, and, and it really, you know, they, they know that Shohei wants to win. They know that Mike Machado isn't going to go anywhere anytime soon. But Shohei may not be an angel at the end, of, you know, by the time the next season comes around. You gotta go for it. You got to go for it now. And, 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 and You know, I, I I think we all want to see Mike Trout and Shohei Otani in, you know, playing ball in October. I think that they have, we, we, we enjoy seeing them during the regular season and, and, for all of us being the diehard baseball fans we are, we know the memories that they can create for us in the postseason. Uh, and, and, and we had a little bit of a glimpse of that in March when, when it came to the World Baseball Classic. So I love this on the Angels' part. Uh, you you got to buy. 
you you have to buy um, because people are going to be knocking at Shohei's door um, at the end of the season, ready to give him an opportunity on on a, on a ball club in which you know he can bring some titles to his city. This is we're, we're talking about someone who who just threw a one hitter and hit two dingers in the same day. Are you kidding me, bro? Who made you? What laboratory were you born in? This is ridiculous, bro. <laughs> And, and it is so fun to watch. He, he's so good for baseball. And, and, and you, you want to see someone like that play on a big stage, on the biggest stage possible. Um, I love it. I love it. They, they, they have their work cut out for them. And so I do want to give the, the credit to the Angels for going for it. Um, they are in a very not tough division. Um but the, it looks like the Rangers aren't going anywhere and, and the Astros are going to continue to be a good ball club because they just got the form of the down. So let's see. Let's see what happens with that. But go to good on the Angels to go for it. If you're going to go for it, you got to go for it. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that, Miles. And, and, you know, as you mentioned with the Otani going off today as, as just another Otani day, uh, that's crazy. That's his first complete game. Uh, and uh, he got it today against the Tigers. And then also when he hit those two home runs, he did have to leave the game because he was holding his side. I think it's mostly precautionary, but hopefully it's nothing, uh, you know, too serious there because obviously that'd be the last thing they need, of course, with them trying to actually go for it. But, uh, Chris, what do you think this deal me- means for the Angels, and, and how do you feel about their scenario, about, like, you know, them, their decision to not move Otani to actually try to go for a wild card spot? I mean, you have to make the playoffs. That's what I said in the season, uh, before the season. You have to make the playoffs if you're the mm-hmm. Angels if you want to have a chance to keep Shohei Otani. Uh-huh. It's similar to what the Chicago Sky are facing with Kalia Copper. you got to make the playoffs if you want to extend her a new deal and have her um, say, yeah, we're going to go for it. Because there's no reason for him to stick around on a mediocre team when people are going to be throwing mountains of money at him in the offseason. Or this dude is so good, he could – he could he could legitimately just go back home and not play baseball again and still be a legendary figure and be and be good. Mm-hmm. So the Angels have to get to the playoffs. A wild card spot, they're gonna have to make some more moves because they really they've really got to chase down the division with who they've got. Like they they've made an effort and done some at least decent things in terms of prospect building to put these other decent guys in that lineup, but. When you the year came and the Rangers decided that enough was enough and they were going to shoot for it, along with the Astros, and even though the Mariners are faltering, they're still, you know, a ball club that could screw your day up once the calendar turns to late August and September. They've got to add more in order to fight for the division because even with two wild card spots, three wild card spots, excuse me, that AL East is going to be a scrap. And there might not be any more t- places at the table left if you're looking at the bottom seeds in the playoffs. Yeah. What about you, Gabe? What are your thoughts there? I just respect the fact that the Angels going all in and they they so willing to go all in that they willing to pay into the luxury tax to do it. And they really have no choice. And it makes sense on an array of levels, even from a business standpoint, because if Shohei Otani continues to keep hitting, the way that he's been hitting, he could possibly break Aaron Judge's single season record for most home runs hit by an American League player in the, in a season. So, from a it makes sense from a business standpoint on and off the field for them to go for it. But have you guys looked at the schedule that these guys are going to be facing? They got three against Toronto this weekend. Then they open up next week with three on the road against Atlanta. And if you ever been in Atlanta, you know they're going to get 40000 every night, and that battery is going to be very loud over there in Cobb County. And then you got Seattle at home, San Francisco at home in early August, and then you got Houston and Texas. So it's a lot of big games coming up and a lot of big series, and they're going to need all the help that they could get. Now, they also added Jaime Condelario, the third baseman from Washington, who hopefully mm-hmm. he gives them something, but I hope that injury to Otani is not serious because if it is with this gauntlet of a schedule that's coming up in August that can make or break them, it, it, it's not good. It's not good. But to, to see them give up two of their top three prospects, even though they don't have the richest farm system, to get two guys who are on the last year of their contract but could be vital pieces to their 
starting rotation and bullpen respectively. I, I tip my cap to him. And Artie Moreno has put his money where his mouth is. And they have to do it because if they want to have any shot at re-signing Otani, this is the cost of doing it. Me personally, I think no matter what happens, Otani is as good as gone. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Do you say and you say that they they're in talks with with uh, the Nats or they got him yet? I said that they I, I believe that they got Jaime Candelario. I, I know that they were at least from what I saw being reported. Yeah, yeah, I think I think they're just close on getting him. I think they will get okay. him honestly eventually, but I'm I'm on the train with you. Uh they're gonna get him. But yeah, I think John Heyman, I think as as soon as like ten hours ago said that. Uh, yeah, you're right. They I were see close. Yeah. They, they, yeah. they 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 discussed it. If yeah, they could get him, okay. that would be a huge. Pickup. Oh yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And 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 that's one of the. It's, it's funny because that's one of the guys that a lot of people have mentioned with the Cubs for a third baseman. But um, yeah, I mean that that's probably he's probably one of the hottest commodities of this quiet deadline. Um, because even the next deal that we're I was going to ask you guys about, or just in general, what you guys thought about certain deals that have happened over the last couple of days, because it hasn't been much, but. Uh, I agree with you said about the angels. I mean, they got, you know, they have no choice, but to go for it now. Um, and you know, even there's been some, some, com- or some, some rumors, I guess, that have come out to over the last few hours that Otani is comfortable in Anaheim and would be willing to stay. Uh, I definitely don't like that whatsoever. <laughs> I like the loyalty. I, I like, I know, yeah, 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 it, yeah. I hope it's not true. But not if PR. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, another th- another thing too is that they talked about today is that besides that p- part, but I got uh, uh, there were other rumors as well that uh, that the, he didn't really want to move either this in the during the deadline, like he didn't want to be traded. And then I was kind of like, man, that just sounds like some BS that like uh, a GM tells a reporter to put in put in the headlines because he doesn't want to get beef like you know with the reporters every day. You know, he doesn't want to get you know what I'm saying like. <laughs> Like, I can believe not wanting to be traded though in the middle of the season. True, but you're also talking about having yeah. to get a new apartment, you know, <laughs> new translator in his case, which he needs after you know yeah. building a relationship with the translator of the Angels and stuff. Like it, it's so much that changes, and then you don't even know if you're gonna stay there after the season. Because at best, like if he did get traded, he was only gonna be there for like a few months, mm. and then I gotta yeah. see whether or not I'm gonna resign with this team or not. And if it was a team like Tampa Bay or, you know, a, a team like Milwaukee or whatever, where we know he's not re-signing, it's like, I got to go here. <laughs> I, 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 I think that I agree happened with that. to Hideki Masui. Mm-hmm. It did. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the, another thing, too, is that, is like, what do they expect Otani to be like, yeah, I want to leave when he's going to stay, right? You know what I mean? Like, right. what do you, you don't, I don't expect them to say otherwise as well. Uh, on the contrary to that, but yeah, no, I think it's it's gonna be. I'm definitely rooting for the Angels at this point. At least, hopefully, they can make some kind of run with him. Just because you know, like like we've yep. said, probably like, I, don't, I don't think he's gonna resign with them. So, uh, yeah. But on the other side of town, the Dodgers actually made probably one of the bigger trades so far as well uh, by getting Ahmed Rosario from the Guardians, and this is a guy that you guys have seen plenty of uh, plenty of games with him with the Guardians there. Uh, Chris, what do you think about this deal with uh, Rosario going there? The other side of the deal has Cindergard going to the Guardians, which I think is really, you know, pretty much meaningless in my opinion. But Chris, go you can go ahead and say your your take on. It. Uh, from a sentimental standpoint, it's like we're seeing that we're just we're seeing the end of Noah Cindergard, who I I really yeah. loved. I lo- I'm like I've had a soft spot. I've had a soft spot for the Mets since 2000, um, when they went to the World Series. And I wanted that rotation to be nice and it just never developed. And he was one of the reasons why just the injuries really took a toll on him and his career. On the other side, Ahmed Rosario, who was also a Mets prospect who didn't quite live up to the hype potential in New York, but then went to Cleveland and was a a pretty serviceable, I'll say serviceable everyday player. This just is an addition for, for Los Angeles, for the Dodgers. It's not a, a big needle moving kind of deal but it's it's a preliminary it's like an appetizer and i think it does something to shore up their um infield depth i think rosario they moved him around the outfield at times too uh but it at least shores up some of their some of their position player depth and he's the guy who has good speed who hits the ball the other way and if you stick him in like the bottom third of your lineup it maximizes what you get out of that lineup so it's it's a solid deal for them if not like 
a really, really big needle moving kind of deal. What about you, Gabe? What do you think about that deal? Well, it, it makes sense because now with a move like this, you can move Mookie back to his natural position in the outfield mm. and just let him go to work and, and do his thing while you got Ahmed Rosario, a guy who's, as, as Chris alluded to, he has a, a bunch of speed on the base paths. He's going to wreak havoc once he gets on base. Is a very sound and disciplined hitter and keeps a very simple approach at the plate. And when he's driving the ball up the middle of the field, he's usually – doing his thing. I, I I don't mind it. And I, I look at it as a nice rental piece for Los Angeles. As far as Cleveland, I don't get the move per se, but I guess what this tells me is, is that, hey, they, that this really Minnesota's division to lose, basically. <laughs> and I think if Shane Bieber wasn't hurt, he oh. might've got moved too. Oh man. You know? And yeah. I'm anxious to see what they do going forward. I I, I don't know a center guard to Cleveland, though. It, it, it's I, I don't understand it for them, but for, for the Dodgers, I totally get it. And, they, and they're getting a guy that they hope can provide them with some solid defensive play at short, which he's known for, and some speed on the base path, <laughs> who can hit either at the top part of the order if necessary or at the lower part of the order. Yeah, I agree with that. He's he's yeah, he's a good ball player. I think he he does br- bring some good stuff to the Dodgers, a team that also got Kike Hernandez back on the team, another versatile guy who they love oh. there. So I think those are a couple of additions that are not you know a big splash, uh, but they definitely make they're going to make an impact. I'm sure they'll have some big games in October. So Miles, what do you think about this deal overall as well? You know, I really like it for the Dodgers. I like how the Dodgers are adding depth. I think I think that you know. The, the, you know, as, as of a few days ago with, with Kike coming back and, and Med, you know, being acquired for this ball club, even even more, even more uh, deep. Um, so it's it's great. It's great for the Dodgers. Um, you know, I, I think I think Syndergaard has had a very interesting career to this point uh, in terms of being the man at one point on the Mets and then kind of bouncing around a little bit. So in, in terms of the Guardians with, with Syndergaard going there, I'm, I'm curious, do we know if he's going to be kind of someone out of the bullpen or is he going to jump into that rotation that's what i that's where i'm a little bit confused on just in terms of i know um they they are down a few arms in cleveland so that's what i'm curious about this is yeah yeah Yeah. so i think i think that's where that's where i'm curious and and and, you know Syndergaard was moved to the bullpen because he was struggling as a starter but at this point do you just move him back into the rotation maybe have him as like a back-end guy i don't know if I'm the Guardians, I would. If you can give me at least five, six solid a night, that's all I can. That's I'm fine with that from Norris in the guard. I'm not asking him to go seven, eight, or even nine. Um, you just got to keep us in the game for for the time that you're in there. So I like it. I like it on both sides. I'm still, you know, we'll 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 see what what comes of the Guardians as they are still kind of um, treading above water a little bit, and then you know they're playing the White Sox right now in Chicago. So. We'll see. I, I do like this for the Dodgers a lot, especially, you know, just bringing Kike back and then Ahmed Rosario, who's actually a pretty solid bat for the most part, not lighting the world on fire. Um, but, you know, he has some good offensive depth to this lineup. Yeah, actually, Miles, and you mentioned it with the Noah Syndergaard thing. Uh, according to an article by Cleveland.com, they said uh, Terry Francona is, is going to give uh, Noah Syndergaard space to find himself, and he's going to make a Ooh. start on Monday. Uh, so, I guess, yeah. So they're going to like probably try him out in the rotation if it doesn't work out. Ooh. Open probably is what it sounds like. Um, but yeah, I mean, as much as much as I don't necessarily disagree with what Chris was saying, how it's like the end of Noah Syndergaard, maybe I, I hope that, you know, s- somehow he ends up like a – because I feel like he'd still be a good bull, a bullpen piece if it doesn't work out for him in the rotation sure. anymore. Um, yeah. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully that works out. Uh, but the one thing I did want to end this show with, of course, is to talk about what do you guys think the biggest splash is going to be? And if it's going to be Nolan Arenado, that actually might happen or might is a possibility, I should say, because it uh, came out today, um, as like I said, recording this on, on Thursday, July 27th, that the Dodgers are apparently have inquired on Nolan Arenado. And Nolan Arenado has said that he is open to a deal to the Dodgers, that he wouldn't reject that. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, Gabe, let's we'll start with you. Uh, what do you think is gonna be the biggest splash? And if you may, may, maybe I know you've said before on this show that you don't think Arenado's gonna be moved, him or Goldschmidt. But 
has your stance changed a little bit? Do you think that's possible? If not, who do you think would be the, the biggest splash of this quiet deadline? I know it's kind of a hard question because you really, it might not be anybody that honestly, but uh, uh, what's your take? I think somebody's going to get dealt. If, okay. it, you know, and, and even though I said last time we talked, I didn't think Arenado mm-hmm. was touchable. If he's willing to waive his no trade clause and St. Louis gets a package that they like, and I could see it. And the reason why I say I could see the Cardinals and Dodgers doing the deals is because the Dodgers have catchers in the MLB pipeline type 100. Mm -hmm. And we know that St. Louis is not pleased with their catcher situation, even after signing Wilson Contreras to a five-year deal Mm -hmm. for over $80 million this past winter. And we saw his name floating in some trade rumors at the top of the week saying that they were willing to move him. So I, I, I could see them doing a deal if they're willing to provide the Cardinals with catching and pitching, which the Dodgers have a ton of in their farm system. It's just a matter of is Arenado willing to waive his no trade clause, which they say he would be, but his agent kind of pressed on that because he said he would also be willing to do it for other teams, not just the Dodgers, but – I, I don't know. One team that I would like to see make a big move, though, as far as, like, just talking solely on the trade deadline is the Baltimore Orioles. I think the time is now to strike while the iron is hot. You got a ton of prospects in the top 100 that can help teams. Some of these guys aren't going to make it with your ball club because you're that stacked, such as a Connor Norby or whatnot. If you can trade those pieces to get a solid ace, you do it. What are your thoughts, Chris? Uh, you think that the Arenado deal is possible? If not, uh, what other guys are you looking to move? Or even a team, as Gabe said, the Orioles, of course, would be another team that you're kind of waiting on to make a deal. Um, as good as they are, um, they you kind of you can, they, I feel like they kind of need like a cherry on top to kind of like solidify their position in the AL. They do, because that that's a team that you add to, even though they've got a lot of young prospects in um that are that are making it mark that are on the team up in the majors now i think that bringing a guy in to play third would be would be solid for them i would honestly bring in somebody else on their pitching staff if they could swing it too but the angels or sorry the orioles you have to make your mark to be able to stay above well above water in that division there's just too many uh teams that are always gunning for it with tampa bay with Boston, with New York. And, you know, the Red Sox aren't really in it like that this year, but you can't just stand pat with what you have. Even if you have prospects, young guys who are burgeoning stars, you have to continue adding to that, uh, to to what you have. So I think bringing in Arenado would be one, it would be a big splash. It would be a far cry from what we saw from Baltimore three, four years ago and would let, again, serve notice. Like we talked about 30 minutes ago, to their fans that they are willing and ready to put up to make these splash moves in order to stay at the top of that division every single year. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but just saying that you're willing to make those moves helps you gain stability in a division like the American League East. So I'd be I wouldn't be surprised to see Baltimore do to make a move like that. Texas, I I don't know how much they need to do, but even as good as they're playing, this is the first year with the personnel that they have, that they've been this solid. And they could, I think, do with uh, maybe another another starting pitcher, another reliever, just to shore up the depth on them as they make the stretch oh, no run. Um, so I think it's those two teams. If Seattle had a slightly better record, I would look for them to be, to be sellers because I wouldn't want them to lose the momentum that they had over the last two seasons either. But they've been kind of struggling around 500. So I don't look for them to sell, but I don't look for them to buy anything really splashy. Texas yeah, I mean, definitely got to make a move. They yeah. definitely got to make a move. Just watching them in June, they they cost themselves a sweep here in Chicago with their bullpen. And mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if the Rangers and the White Sox made a deal as far as relievers go. Because Texas has a prospect, a, a rich uh, glutton of prospects that they could deal as well if necessary. Yeah, and, and that that's true. And, and I think, you know, uh, with the Rangers, it, they got Chapman but I still think they need more. And I think that I, – I don't yeah. know if they're going to go too hard. I don't see I don't, I don't. don't see them necessarily going too hard and getting another piece, which I, I'm going to be surprised, but I just don't think – I think Chapman might have been their biggest thing that they're going to – their biggest deal that they're going to do so far. But I will say this to, to, to Gabe's credit as well is, like, it's going to be really tough for them to hold off the Astros. I don't care what anybody tells me. 
I mean, the Astros two games back, we saw yeah. how good that series was. I know that the the Rangers blew them out in that last game. Things got testy, but it's going to be really hard to hold off those those Astros for a whole couple months uh, to end the season. So yeah, they would probably they definitely need something. Uh, but we'll see how how they add it or how they do it, uh, for sure. But another thing too is Chris, you mentioned the the Mariners, and yeah, it's kind of funny because we're talking about uh, the Cubs being buyers, uh, and the Mariners are almost in that same identical spot when you're looking at them in the um, whether it be in the division or whether it be in the wild card. There's just a couple games difference there. They're seven and a half games back in the division. Um, obviously, in the situation, obviously the the the, the teams in their division is what differs there. And that's why they don't, I guess that's why they think they're going to be sellers is because, you know, they're not going to catch the Rangers or the Astros, but uh, miles in, in your, in your uh, take, what, what do you think is going to be the, you know, the biggest move of the uh, trade deadline, or do you think it's going to be Arenado uh, as moving from the, from the Cardinals to the, maybe the Dodgers? Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting with, with, with Arenado and, and it's like, I want to, rule that out because of the, the quality player that he is, which really is pretty much like an understatement. Mm-hmm. He's also my favorite player. And so I think, you know, in it, 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 part of it feels like it, it might not be too far fetched with the Cardinals. We've seen them kind of have an interesting mindset this year in, in sort of jumping ship on guys quickly, sending down Jordan Walker because they want him to, I, I, I don't know. I, forgot I what still don't get was. that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it, it's just, you know, it's 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 an organization that's, that is, they have very interesting. Um, they're in a very interesting position because they are operating without Yadier or Molina for the first time, and you're kind of seeing kind of like a scramble kind of mentality with this with this ball club in terms of moving guys and and and, and, and Oliver Marmol kind of having conversations. It's a very weird organization right now, and so I'm wondering, you know, if. If Nolan Arenado does get moved to the Dodgers, what does it mean? What does that mean for the rest of that division? Um, the Dodgers are already deep enough as it is. I mean, I think they succeed even without Arenado, but you put Arenado on that ball club, it's pretty much the icing on the cake. You, you, you almost can wrap it up for the most part in that division. So, you know, I'm curious to see what will what, happen with that. I'm also curious to see if the Reds are going to continue to kind of build off of their momentum mm-hmm. as well. I, I have a strong eye on, on the Brewers and the Reds at the moment, seeing what moves are they going to make going forward. And we know that Milwaukee just got Carl Santana. It's a solid move uh, for sure. Um, I'm very intrigued by the NL Central um, just because we got we got two teams right now with, with the Cubs and then the Reds who are starting to find themselves in this moment. So, Let's see. I couldn't. I couldn't predict who's going to get moved where, just because I think everything is up in the air right now. But if there's if there are teams who I feel like maybe making moves going forward uh, by the deadline, I'm looking at the Reds. I'm looking at the Brewers. I'm even looking at the Phillies, who are right there. Um, even though in, in terms of just being competitive, Phillies are a few moves away from from not not exactly catching the Braves, but making even even more noise. You know, they got they got off to kind of a uh, rough start this year, and here they are, fifty-five and forty-seven. They're ten games back of the Braves, but man, that's nothing. That's nothing to, to, to scoff at at all. The Phillies are right there. So, in terms of just looking at teams, those are the teams who I have my eye on at the moment. And you know, I'm curious to see what is going to happen going forward. Um, and I'm very intrigued by the NL Central division specifically. Yeah, and it's funny you you mentioned that because when you mentioned the the Cubs in the division. Is they stand, you know, six games out. Of course, nine o'clock games not over yet. They're probably it's going to be five after you know they or they take you know take down the uh, the Cardinals because nine one right now. But yeah, I mean, as much as they have a, a case for the division, they're four and a half games out of a wild card spot. So even if they, and a lot of people were saying the only way that a central team makes the play or a second playoff team makes it, uh, or excuse me, the only way that a team like the Cubs would make it is if they win the central. Now I don't know about that. I mean, it's going to be hard to 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 take down the Brewers. I, I won't lie about that. Uh, I think that a guy yeah. like Carlos Santana, while look, while looking like a very, like, like uh, a small addition, I'm sure he'll hit two home runs off Justin Steele come September or something. So I'm not, I would be surprised. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be, it's going to be one of the most interesting races for sure in all baseball, seeing how the NL wildcard shapes up and how the central shapes up, but definitely by come Tuesday, 
uh, you know, we, we might look at these divisions and see it something else. Cause I don't know what kind of additions either of those teams are any of these teams in the center are going to do, but uh, yeah. I think it's a good uh, place to wrap things up for this edition of the at bat baseball podcast uh, for Salvador Rodriguez. I want to thank miles Porter again. Congratulations miles on your all-star team. Congrats to that. Uh, of course, uh, Chris Pennant, uh, thanks for coming on, who, of course, you can see on the CHGO Sky Show, as well as he's the co-host of the Skyhook podcast. Gabriel Wilkins, who you've seen on War Media's Open Run. Appreciate you guys coming on, and hopefully everyone enjoys the trade deadline. Have a good one, everybody.